Welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we are going to talk about OSL, Object Source Lighting. Or in other words, the illusion that something on your miniature is casting light elsewhere on your miniature. So before we, uh, before we get too deep into it, and we're going to do some examples with this Warp Gnaw Vermin Lord here, there's a few things I want to talk about when it comes to this guy, and when it comes to OSL in general. So. The first thing we have to understand with OSL is that, number one, you, only, you don't want to always do it. Just because something glows doesn't necessarily mean anything. What I mean by that is walk outside at noon in the middle of the day and strike a match and see how much that changes the, the light situation. The answer is zero because however bright that thing is, is, in, is overwhelmed completely by the sun. Right? So if you're painting your figure to be in normal bright daylight and all the rest of your colors are highly saturated and highly contrasted and then you have them holding a torch and it's like blowing the entire side of them out with orange light, it's going to ring false immediately because it wouldn't have that much of an effect. Okay? So when we're doing OSL, we have to choose the piece. It has to be something with darker colors, more muted colors. It'll look better when you're taking things like photographs in front of a black background. If it's like your tabletop army, it's gonna look strange unless it's a very minimal glow. Okay, so if you have an incredibly hot source, like a plasma gun, and you have it very minimally glowing, like just the rest of the you know, carbide or whatever's there, I don't know, the rest of the barrel, that's generally fine, because that's so bright and so intense that it would, even in a bright situation, it would still change the ambient color a little. Okay? So that's thing number one. Thing number two is, so assuming we've got the colors right, you cannot strike a light without creating a shadow. And what I mean by that is when you use OSL, if it's a large piece of OSL, where it's like, again, imagine this figure was holding a single torch here, we would want it to be dimmer than on this side if I were making it to be completely in shadow, right? And as a point of fact, if you look over here, there's a lot more of this side of the rat, right? There's a lot more of this side of him that's completely, that's darker and more desaturated when you look in this area. Now, that being said, with our little rat friend here, um, we're not, I'm doing minimal OSL. He has these warp shards embedded in his skin. The second thing you have to understand is there's a very advanced layer to this we're not going to go in today, which with colored light and how they interact with colored surfaces. Okay. Needless to say, like there are very subtle nuances to the way light and color work. For an easy example, if you had a green light, perfect green, and it was broadcast against a red ball, okay, it would change not at all because assuming both colors were exact hues, red does not reflect green. It reflects 0% green. That is why it's red, okay? So the point being, now there's all sorts of layers to that because there really aren't perfect colors in the world. Everything is slightly polluted, blah, blah, blah. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about two primary methods and I'm gonna assume that how we want to attack our OSL is we have our miniature in fairly normal light, but we have something on it that's hot and creating a glow, okay? So if that's the case, there are really two different ways we do OSL. So to show you the first way, I'm gonna turn him like this. Now, this is surface dependent. So here on his skin, I highlighted all his skin first and you'll notice you see how like the edges here are so bright that's because that's anticipation i did it colorless but i put in the highlights around where i wanted it and i did it colorless for a reason like just basically with a neutral high tone i was still sketching the light so your two primary ways to do osl are as a last step a glaze 
And if you do that, then you need to create your light and value patterns before you ever put down the color. So like what I mean is right here, you can see how this is lighter colored and lit up and then falls into shadow. Same with up here around his face, right? These edges are lit, okay? The other option is if you have an extremely highly reflective surface like this, which is steel, okay? I just simply worked it into the steel. So as I was painting this, I simply worked the green into the steel and created the light from there and the shadows and so on and so forth. Now, there's still a brighter light in this coming from above. These warp stones are weak in their glow versus the sun. That's how I've painted the rest of this guy. Like if you look at him, there's still light up here and light up here on his nose and stuff like that. So there's still a fairly bright light coming from above or some kind of zenith light. But nonetheless, this is creating this pale glow, okay? Now we've also got this big rock and it's casting up. And so again, I worked it into the warp blades. Um, I also just kind of decided, well, these are going to be kind of green because I did the bottom two. I just liked them being kind of green. So this one's more glow. These are This is more subtle onto something that's already green infused. But you notice I kept the edges that are curved and facing away in steel. Okay. But we have this big, nice chunk of warp stone. This is our real source of light here. And so we're going to show how that works on the wood. The next thing you want to think about is that the source of light always needs to be the brightest. You'll notice that with most of these gems, I have them coming up to this like very bright yellow, yellow white at the very tips or edges or something like that. That's for a reason, because the thing creating the light is has to be brighter than the thing that the light is cast upon. And this is very easy. Point a light bulb at a white wall. White is highly reflective of light, <clears throat> right? That's why it appears as the color white, because it's reflecting the whole spectrum back at you. Nonetheless, it will still be dimmer in color, <clears throat> or sorry, in intensity, than the actual thing creating the light. Like the light bulb, the light producer, is always going to be stronger than the light reflection in intensity. Okay? So I did a couple here in advance, a couple areas of his skin through the glazing and stuff like that. So if we turn over here, you can see how we cast this minor green glow around his skin, right? And how it's casting it out. We also tried to focus it on things where it would catch, like the edges of the cloth, okay? Same here, the edges of this flesh where it's poked up, right? So light, from your OSL is going to act just like light from light, like from your actual zenith, and that it's going to gather along edges and reflect at that point. To make your mixture and your glaze for your OSL, you generally want to grab the mid-tone color of whatever your light source is. So when we look at this gem, this runs from like a yellow to a very dark color here, right? So I'm grabbing like this range of color in here. Okay, um, something in the middle area. The second thing you always want to have handy <coughs> is, excuse me, is a little bit of the whatever color you're glazing onto. What I mean by that is like here, I'm glazing onto skin. So I have some of his skin tone down here in the palette as well. And that's so I can come in and glaze back over this if I need to, because we're going to be very minimal with this. And but we still might get it too much. Good OSL is generally very weak. Unless you're doing a figure completely in shadow where it is it is the light source. So the difference between OSL and an ambient light source is like, imagine that this guy, there was a big fire down here on his base or something like that, right? And that was the only light source. If that's the determinative light source, then all reflections would need to come out of it and all of my value sketching would have needed to come out of it and reflect from it. So this bottom of his chin and this ear on the bottom side would suddenly become the hot spots, right? Because they would be getting the light cast up here. That's not what we're doing here with most of our OSL when we're doing things like glowing eyes or plasma weapons or a character holding a torch or a magic ball of energy or having a big giant warp ball glow or warp shards embedded in your skin, right? These are minimal-ish light sources. 
So we want to make sure you can see where that glow is right there. We want to make sure that it's that the skin and the color of the world it's in is still winning and and doing most of the work, right? This is creating a very soft, translucent, localized glow. Okay, so that's a lot. I know that's like ten minutes of theory, and that's a lot of theory, but it's really important stuff. There is nothing more complicated I can paint than OSL because it is violating the fundamental rules of how light interacts with our miniature and the way we paint. I say that to really explain that if all miniature painting is a study of light, and it is, OSL is one of the most complicated things you can do. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to say if you're going to jump into OSL, it's your first time, you're going to fail. If it's your 10th time, you're probably going to fail. If it's your 50th time, you're getting somewhere. Okay? This is the kind of thing you have to do a lot to make it look good, make it look right. Because you need to consider, okay, this thing's casting light. To determine what that means, this little tiny rock in his arm, I need to know how bright is this thing, what is the color of the thing around it, what are the angles of the thing around it, what is the color of the underlying thing it's reflecting onto, how intense is this versus how intense is the other light source? What are my other light sources? Where are they coming from? What is the texture and color of the other items that it might catch on that are more distant but might be more highly reflective? For example, if this was a metal bracer, I might have no light here but still want to reflect a tiny bit of green here in this bracer because it's a polished metal surface or something. It's not. This is dirty cloth. But my point being, to do like really top-end OSL, like you see somebody like Roman Lepot do, that's the kind of things he's asking himself, right? You don't need to do all of that to do your first OSL. I'm just saying, like, that's if you're trying to climb that ladder. This is a, If you're trying to climb that ladder, it's a deep well. Did I mention I like mixed metaphors? Okay, so let's actually get into this. I've got some of my fluorescent green down here from War Colors. By the way, the fluorescent range is excellent for doing OSL. Fantastic set of colors. They're very bright. I really like them. They make an incredible fluorescent orange and fluorescent pink. Highly recommend. Um, I've also got some game, uh, Vallejo Game Ink Green. Uh, I love this color. Great for warp stone and stuff like that. Look at how rich and vibrant that is, right? That's what a lot of that, that's what's providing that intensity, that high volume, because it's such a dense green pigment. So I really love it. Anyway, what I've got here is a mix on my palette right here of a little bit of fluorescent mixed with some of that green ink. I'm going to get my brush wet, and we're going to do this area on his face, like right here, okay? So I'm going to get this. It's his glaze consistency at best. It's probably thinner than that. I'm going to wick off the excess down here on my paper towel. Extremely important. You do not want this out of control. I'm going to test it on the back of my hand. And then with all that being done, I'm gonna come in here and I'm just gonna very lightly hit the edges of the highlights where I've already prepped them with the high value. I've taken them to white because I knew they were gonna be like that. And then I'm gonna draw my brush toward the color. Now, the parts that are nearest need to be the strongest. The parts that are farthest need to be weaker. It is much better to do a couple glazes and let them dry and determine how well it looks than it is to go overboard too fast. Okay? So we're going to do that very light. You can see we've got that minor green glow and we're going to let that dry. While I'm waiting, I'm going to come down here to this next one. Just get all these. Always pulling my brush toward the source of the light. Now again, I've already prepped these areas by having these edges be real white so that they pick up the glaze well. I don't know how well this is going to show on camera. We'll see. Okay. We'll do his eyeball too since we're right here. Like his eye is obviously this big chunk of, of warp stone on this side. It's a cool eyeball. So obviously the eyebrows are going to all get hit. 
So we're going to go ahead and put some green up there like that. We're just going to very lightly pull that glow down. Okay, so now we can see that very soft green glow to the eye. Now that these have dried, I can come in and say, okay, I want to go a little bit more intense. I can pull that in. As well, I want to take the underside of this cheek, right? And I'm going to put a little bit of soft green on it. Very light. Just going to avoid and smooth that around just a little bit. Because it's raised up. So it would catch just a little bit of it. I just want to add that hint of that green. Right? Just very light touch of that green that it's reflecting there. Okay? We could do the same thing if we wanted. And we could be very, very subtle. And we could take just a little bit of this and run it right along here. Most of the stuff isn't even going to be noticeable. Like somebody won't really see what's going on unless they look real close. But the, one of the tricks with OSL is your brain really, really understands how light works. You might not, but your subconscious mind does. Okay? Because you see a, a reference every time you open your eyes. Period. So because of that, when something looks correct, you just feel it. If you've ever looked at like a paint job and thought, yeah, that looks right. Like that's how the world should look. That's because someone has caught all the little nuances of the way that those, that light will behave, right? And because of that, your brain just buys into it. Now, you'll notice how in each of these cases, this fig makes it easy because it's got the way that this is split, like coming out of his skin. But an important part of OSL is you want to have something dark separating the light creating object and the light reflection. So in this case it was easy because he has these ridges down in his skin. So I've got these really dark, you know, sort of crevices down here or around his eye. But you want to make sure that happens. So if I were to color value this, one is your hot spot, two is your mid-tone color of intensity, then we go to three for the darkest color, and then we go to two again, but in a thin glaze for your outer ring of color. All right? Now, if you want to bring, like, let's say you're not happy with that green cheek, okay? Like, I look at that green cheek and I'm like, you know what? Actually, I'm going to put a little up on his ear, too. Because he got a little ear here. And that would have, that's close enough, it would get a little green. A little on the bottom. A little on the top. Okay. So... And that's just it. You got to really trace this light around and figure out how intense is it? Where are the edges? Where are things going to, where is light going to get caught? Okay. All right. But let's say you go a little too hard. You know, that's like too strong or like right here on his bicep. I'm not super happy with how that looks. Okay. No problem. We'll go back to our skin tone here. We're going to take a nice little thin glaze of that. Test that out. You can see how thick that is. Like, that is super thin. Okay? And then I'm going to come in, and I'm just going to glaze out the edge of it. So it's kind of just fading that green. Okay, very light touch. We just slightly weaken it. Now we can also come in if we need to like pick out the edges some more. 
we can bring some of that flesh back up to the edges or down here where we want to show some of the light casting. Okay. So we can be really, really light touch with this stuff. But by then really brightening that edge where it's closest and the light is catching it, laying a little bit of that skin highlight back in. We create the illusion that it's the brightest right there. Okay? We can then either keep that or on that closest spot we can take a brighter version of our OSL color. So in this case we'll go for just the fluorescent green. Get that worked into a little bit of a glaze here. By the way, I know my palette is very messy. Deal with it. I'm at the end of this guy. Uh, OSL is always one of the last things I do. Like if you're doing this sort of glaze style, you can see where I wanted it done earlier, I worked it in. And then I come in with just my fluorescent green and I pop up those highlight spots that I went back over with the skin tone. So I started by establishing sort of my base color, my base value, right? Like where the green was being cast. And then I come back in with this wonderful fluorescent. And then I cover those same areas. Okay? Just those very edges with the brightest version. That way we get a, a bit of a fade. Lovely fade. Uh, from one area to the other. Okay? So that way what I can see is exactly where that's going, all right? Okay. So now I've got this subtle green glow here. You can see also I've got some of that down there. Now, the final thing we can do that I'll tell you is when you're dealing with colored light, especially on skin, green is fun on skin because it's easy. It's the easiest version of what I'm about to talk about. But you can do this on with other things too, is we can desaturate it by using its complementary color or, or some kind of version of it. Green on skin is interesting because skin has pink, and pink is like what? Well, it's like red. So the other thing I can do is I've got just some thin, like, Reichland flesh shade here. When I hit that over the edge of the OSL, what it's going to do is immediately counteract it. It's like this sort of matter-antimatter clash because you're putting a thin version of its complementary color over top of it. It will just sort of cancel the effect out. And it's a really interesting effect for just making your, your, uh, your OSL disappear into the model. If you're doing glow onto something else, like let's say you've got uh, blue space marine armor or something and you're trying to work in like a red glow onto it that's tougher you know but you can use um, you're already sort of doing that but you can have it you know go to orange or bring the blue back over it and that'll achieve much the same thing good OSL is very very subtle OSL okay and it's achieved through these very minor glazes back and forth so you can see that just slight green hue there. We don't want to, one of the most common problems I see people do with OSL is they go in and they're like, well, I want this to be green and this to be a green glow. So I'll take this same green and I'll paint it around it. Nope. 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 We have to be extremely thin, extremely translucent, and we have to make sure that we're seeing the, the tones that should be underneath coming through. So where those edges fall at those angles 
where light would collect around the edges, like here. That's where we want it to be brightest, and we want it to fade into the normal light of the model, or into the normal shadow of the model, or the color of the model, whatever. Okay? And that's, uh, so that's OSL on there. I'm going to show you one more over here. We've got a more intense source. The brighter the source of your OSL, such as this super bright warpstone rock, the more you can push it. Now, here, what I'm going to do, um, since I've got this big rock, but it's also a darker color, which means it's going to be harder to move the color on. That's both an advantage and a disadvantage, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that green. I've already prepped it. You can see see where that white is. I've already prepped a little bit of it again with that value sketch. But I'm going to take that green and just run it along here. Okay. Then I'm going to avoid my brush and just come down on the back side and just really smooth out that edge. So we just disappear into the wood, right? And what we get is something very subtle. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna let that dry. I'll get the top part here while I'm waiting for that to dry. So we would also throw light up here on the bottom of this rope and certainly over here on this one. this bottom metal spike on the sides. Okay. Okay. So now we've got our oh it'd be I missed a spot. One of the one of the trickiest parts about this is really just tracing out everything. And obviously this big white strap here. Yeah, duh. That would collect too, Vince. What are you doing? Probably that one, and that's pointing at an upward angle too. Okay. There we go. I'm happy with that. Okay. Alright, so now we've got that nice subtle green glow put in there on kind of all those places. Now, already having set the basic values with some of those tones, you'll notice that over here on the side, I really darkened the wood down, all right? Same with that side. You see how that's darker, more desaturated? That's because if this is a brighter light source and this is turned away from my zenith light coming from up here, then this should be pretty darn dark, right? So what I want to do now is I want to figure out where my light points are. I'm going to come in with a very thin, subtle ivory, and I'm using ivory here. Actually, the, the proper color I'm using, if you're really curious, is Scale 75 Birch, which is a very soft white. And I'm going to find those areas where I want to really trap the light along this wood. So like here at this knot, and here on this little, I don't know, whatever this is, this little spike. There's like a little pop right here. Probably like a line down here or something. Like if you can see an edge where it will catch. Right up here at the top of the rope. Right up here at the top of the rope. Here at this edge. Here at that edge. Right at the bottom of that. the edges of these ropes. Okay. Then what I'm going to do, so now that I've got all of those brightened up, right, is I'm going to come in with just my fluorescent green, my brighter reflection color, I'm going to pop them down, pop it down just over those spots where I want it to really show that reflection. So 
So you can see that we don't want just a normal like spread of the light. It doesn't just go and hit all over the place, right? Instead, what we want is we want there to be areas where the light has captured. And we can build that up multiple times through applications of things like a little bit of white on those hot spots that we then come back in with very thin points of our glaze of our brightest color. In this case, for me, that's fluorescent green. That could be whatever for you, right? Like it, whatever your bright color is, doesn't really matter. And then you come in with a very nice thin glaze of that. And we just pop that right out. And the more times we do that in a progressively smaller area, the more we create that illusion of the light reflecting strongly. As long as the brightness of this part doesn't exceed the brightness of your source, you're fine. Okay? That's basically the trick. It's a lot of subtle glazing back and forth. Remember that if you ever go too far, you can always reset it by using your original color. So like here, I would go back to wood, uh, right? So if I wanted to, to trap that, here I could go back to the wood uh, color and smooth that out with a glaze. Here I can go back to the flesh, right? And reset those if I need to. But that's OSL. Now you can see we've got our nice subtle green glows happening all around the warp stone. The more of it you do where it's capturing and trapping along the edges and it's very subtly pacing out around the item, the more you'll notice, the, the more you'll kind of see the whole image snap into focus. Again, when, when light isn't working, your brain notices right away, right? So uh, there we go. That's OSL. There's a lot to unpack with it. I could probably do another 30 minute video just talking about OSL and kind of other applications of it. But to summarize at the end, just kind of the takeaway thoughts. One, less is more. Think thin, think glazes, think subtle transitions of color from very bright items. Two, your light source always needs to be the brightest thing and outshine your light reflections. Three, the application of the first thin glaze to establish your color area, and then going back and establishing your highlights, your bright spots, your closest areas of reflection through the application of a highlight color, like a little bit of flesh like I did here, or white like I did here on the staff, and then covering that with a thin glaze of your higher color is a great way to show reflections, spot reflections in your item and really sell the idea that this is a weakening glow, okay? You can see how that looks like it's fading and where the light has been caught at certain points, okay? Um, three, if you ever mess up, don't worry. Uh, you can always just grab some glazes of your original color and knock it right back into tone, okay? Uh, and four, light gathers around edges and pays attention to surface types and color. Something white will reflect more color from farther away than something black or dark. Something metal that's shiny will be more reflective than something that's wood, all right? And so on and so forth. So play around with all those things. Uh, this is a really fun technique. It can really sell a cool image to the model. And it's something you can practice and play with for a long time and, and have lots of different fun with. Uh, so there you go. That's OSL. Um, I really hope you enjoyed that. This is a video I've wanted to do for a long time, but I just couldn't find the right figure that was sort of big enough that I could display it on camera where I thought I could talk about everything I needed to talk about. And then suddenly this guy showed up on my desk. He tunneled in, uh, you know, right through a Skaven tunnel, right up onto my desk and asked to be painted. And who am I to say no when the demon, when the, the demon Lord rat comes to your desk. So at any rate, I certainly hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a like. Uh, subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. If you have any suggestions of things you'd like to see in hobby cheating videos, drop that down in the comments below. I'm always happy to see additional suggestions. Uh, share this with anybody you like. I, uh, sharing is always the nicest thing you can do, and I really appreciate it. And uh, as always, I thank you for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.